Good morning. We're going to discuss the Lord's Supper and Baptism. These are ordinances that Jesus left for us. And we're going to start with the Lord's Supper. We'll talk about it and talk about what our responsibility is, and then we'll experience it together. Then we'll do a song. Then we'll talk about baptism. And we'll have those who are going to be baptized make some statements. And then we'll make our way right at the very close of the service. There's not going to be any lag time. We're going to move from here as many as of you can, because as Mark indicated, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper are both private things, but they're things that are public as well. And so as we stay and, and kind of honor those who are making this step, it's very appropriate. Um, county fair cutouts, we're going to get back to county fairs. The deal with county fairs is things like that, the, the face doesn't really go with the body. And when Paul talks about how the Christians in Corinth are observing the ordinances of the Lord's Supper and baptism, this is kind of what he has in mind. The way the body of Christ was celebrating these ordinances didn't match the instructions in the instruction book. Or the body just didn't go with the head. When we think of celebrating the Lord's Supper and baptism, I guess the question then becomes, what reflects Christ and what doesn't? If there are things that we want to move towards, what are those things that would allow us to celebrate the ordinances in the manner that Jesus gave us to celebrate them? What reflects him and what doesn't? Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, says this, When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. The early church didn't celebrate communion in a church building. Uh, they had no separate buildings for worship. The Lord's Supper was celebrated in a private home, and it was integrated into an actual meal. They ate and drank together, and then as part of that meal, they moved towards focusing on what Jesus said and the words that he gave us to reflect on at the meal. Typical Roman home, Corinth was a Roman city, uh, could accommodate maybe nine people in the dining room, and there was an atrium, and maybe standing up, you could get another 30 or 40 people in the atrium. Uh, the more privileged, respected people, it was kind of the way it worked in Corinth. They got more and better food. They probably would have shown up at the Lord's Supper gathering earlier than everyone else so that they could get the prime places in the dining room where they could recline at table. Uh, apparently, in the Corinthian house churches, communion was a chance to get early, to come early, if you knew the host, and if you didn't have to work perhaps as a slave or a laborer, you could end up showing up at the communion celebration earlier. And that's what was happening. They were showing up early, they were getting the best food, and even getting loaded before anybody else had the opportunity to show up. There were one of two problems that have occurred, and that when Paul opens this letter, he addresses this problem first. There's all kinds of issues in Corinth. In fact, Corinth was noted for fornication. In fact, it was to Corinthianize meant to fornicate. It was a really rough and tumble place. And when Paul zeroes in on something that he's very concerned about, he ends up dealing with immorality, but not first. First, he ends up talking about how when they're celebrating the Lord's Supper, they actually are not bringing honor to Christ, but shame and contempt. Um, and it's either because they're eating early without waiting, or they're eating selfishly without sharing. It would have been, bring your own food. That's kind of the way it would work. It wasn't a potluck meal, so individuals come with their food, and if you had a lot of money, you brought a lot of food. And so you came early because you knew the host, and, and you settled down, and you ate. And then later on, the slaves and the workers, they would come, and they don't have as much food. And what was happening, those who didn't have food couldn't enjoy it. And those who would were stuffing themselves. And with Paul's statement, 
he ends up saying, and I think this is a point, the Lord's Supper isn't merely a private act of piety, focusing on receiving individual forgiveness, but it's a meeting of the Lord's people at a common meal. It's not just, there is a private element to it, but it's not just private. It is God's people meeting together, celebrating a common meal. Now, we're not going to celebrate the actual foodstuffs that we'd have celebrated, but we will take the bread and we will take the juice. And part of it, it's very private, but it's very public. We partake of it together as individuals who are part of God's family. Those who draw Paul's ire are those who act selfishly, either focusing on their own spirituality or exercising their own social privileges. They remain heedless of those who share with them in the new covenant inaugurated by Jesus' death. We're going to experience... We've got these things, COVID-based... Make sure they're safe. And so, anyway. um, juice and bread. Um, this actually, this meal celebrates the new covenant that Jesus inaugurated. The new covenant opens the door of heaven to Gentiles. In the Old Testament, if you're a Gentile, you are a persona non grata. There's not an opportunity for you to become included. But with the new covenant, it inaugurates, it overrides the old covenant, and now it opens the door for, if there are any Jews here, that was prior to, but if we're Gentiles, non-Jews, then it opened the door for us. The new covenant is inclusive. It's not exclusive, and that's Paul's issue. To celebrate a meal whose purpose is inclusion, and do so in a manner that excludes somebody, is contemptible, shows contempt for Christ rather than honors him. That's Paul's issue. Um, he talks about what communion is about. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, we'll look at the rest of the verse, but we're going to land now on really what this meal is about. What is communion about? Remember Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. What communion celebrates? The inauguration of a new covenant that replaces the old covenant. And when we look at what the new covenant is, here's what it says. Here's from Hebrews, and it's directly quoting it from Jeremiah, where the prophecy of this new covenant this, this is where we first hear it. And this is, this is what Jesus came to do. He came so that these ground rules might be instituted. This is what communion, the Lord's Supper, is about. It's about this covenant being inaugurated. And it's what it says, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. We talk about this word, I will forgive their wickedness. Literally, it's I will be. The verb here is not forgive. It's I will be, and then it gives an adjective. I will be and it gives this adjective. I'm going to tell you a Greek word today. Some of you probably know it. Some don't. I will be helios. Helios. That's the word. That's literally what this verse says. I will be helios to their unrighteousness says. And will remember their sins no more. What does helios mean? Helios means gracious, favorable, benevolent, Non-reactive, cheerful, benevolent, favorable, non-reactive. Here's what the new covenant promises. I will be helios to their unrighteousnesses. I will be gracious to them, favorable, benevolent, non-reactive. 
Do you see why that is an even bigger claim than I will forgive? I will forgive, you could imagine, you know, okay then, I'll, I'll overlook that one. But that's not what the new covenant is about. It's helios, non-reactive. And remembering sins no more, we put this in a little thing. With respect to the new covenant, here's what it means. And if we believe this, we are believing what the Lord's Supper is intended to inaugurate. It means that when we do something that is outside of God's will, according to the new covenant, which Jesus came to put into effect, we can say, you're still in me, and you're still with me. Good's still ahead of me, guaranteed. You're still in me because you said you'd put your laws in my mind and write them on my heart. You're still in me. I did wrong, but you didn't leave me. You're still writing your law in my heart. You're still with me. He says, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my, my son, and I'm going to cause you to know me. I'm going to cause you to know me. I'm going to cause you to know me. You're still in me. You're still with me. You know what that means? If God's in you and God's with you, that means good is ahead of you. That's guaranteed because God does not break a covenant that he makes. The only way that you could, well, he did make the old covenant, but he replaced it with the new. Only God can change a covenant. And that's why in the Bible, if you look at it, you might look at the Old Testament and say, God's really angry in the Old Testament. And in the New, he's not. Jesus doesn't reflect him. What happened? Did he run out of bullets? Did he get tired of... You know what ended up happening? God didn't change. God didn't change. You know what changed? The covenant changed. Does that make a difference? It makes all the difference in the world. What it means then, when we do wrong things, and some of you were thinking yesterday, last night, you know what the truth is? And what he would have you think about? God, thanks that you're still in me. You're still with me. But still ahead of me, guaranteed, because you promised to be, remember the word? Helios, gracious, favorable, benevolent, non-reactive to my sins. And remember my sins no more. I'd like you to take the bread. We're going to do this. Then we're going to experience, we're going to sing another song. But it says, The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Before you take it, here's what I'd like you to think about. You know what this represents? This represents a new covenant. And when you take this, I want you to think about those four statements. Jesus died so that you would be able to know you're still in me. You're still with me. Good's still ahead of me. Guaranteed. Why can we why is it guaranteed? Because Jesus inaugurated a new covenant and it's for us. Take and eat. It says in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The issue with Paul that has with the Corinthians, the way they were celebrating, caused people to remember Jesus, but not in a good way. 
people that didn't have enough are being excluded and overlooked. The way they are eating and drinking was the problem. It's not about what they said. They said all the right words. It's the way they were celebrating the ordinance. Eating selfishly, thinking only of themselves. You know what this is? This is a covenant family meal. What I'd like you to do, take the cup. Take the lid off. And I don't want you to look down. I want you to look around. I look around. In communion, we, we think about focusing on ourselves. I don't want you to focus on yourself. Turn around. Look at, look at everyone. Look at the people around you. Everyone, look around. You know what this is? This is our meal. Not my cup. This is our cup. We take it as those, and if you're here, if you believe in Christ, you understood that he came to inaugurate a new covenant, you can partake of this. You don't have to be a member of this church. This is a meal that Jesus invites us to, all of us. And we take this and we drink the cup, looking around, thankful that we're part of a family because God opens the door to us. Take and drink. Talking about the two ordinances that Jesus put in place, the Lord's Supper and Baptism. The Church of Corinth mishandled these two ordinances Jesus left in place. The celebration of the Lord's Supper and Baptism did more harm than good. Paul writes, my brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. So now that I follow Christ, Paul says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Back in the day, Andre Crouch had a song, the blood will never lose its power, but the cross can. The cross can be emptied of power. And that's what Paul talks about. That's what's happening at Corinth. What in the world could empty the cross of power? It would have to be believing the wrong things. Wouldn't you imagine, perhaps? He talks about human wisdom. But what he ends up saying is that this is the problem in Corinth. Chloe is one of the leaders of a house church. Again, that's where the church met. It met in houses. Someone associated with Chloe's house church informed Paul of some problems. There was some quarreling and clicks. Here's the nature of it. Bragging rights based on who they were baptized by. So some believe I was baptized by Apollos. Some, I was baptized by Paul, and then they're actually using that as a pecking order. So if I was baptized by Paul, I am chicken 10, and I get to peck chickens 1 through 9. And that's what's happening. They're pecking one another, pecking at one another, based on who baptized them. And Paul sees these divisions as evidence of a power outage, as the cross being emptied of power. It's not what they do privately that represents the power outage. It's when they gather. That's the problem, both with the Lord's Supper and baptism. Paul was concerned about the church of Corinth being divided into thirds. I checked last night on Wikipedia every once in a while, because I, I said, how many Christian denominations? And I checked that some time back and ended up seeing at that point 41,000. 41,000. Checked yesterday. It's up to 45. 45,000. Um, our problem, Paul's concerned about the church being divided into thirds. And again, I'm not going to come off and be anti-denominational. We can't, but all we're doing is acknowledging that um, we are 15,000 times worse off than Paul was in his day. I did the math. That represents a church split about every six months for the last 2,000 years. Split, 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 split. Division, division. Um, you know what happens when there's a power outage? Yeah, when the church, when the power goes off in your house, what do you do? Check, you go downstairs, check and see if it was 
a breaker get tripped. If no breaker was tripped, and then you look around, and your neighbor's there in the dark too, you know it's regional, and then you call XL Energy, and then you figure out what's the deal, when this is going to be fixed, you find out when it's going to be fixed, and you tough it out. Um, uh, the power outage in Paul's day, and I would say in ours, is not individual, it's regional. There's not, I don't know if we can really fix, can we, can we all become one denomination? No, we can't. Is there anything that we can do individually as we think of people who gather together so that we might encourage the type of things that will honor Christ, whether it be celebrating the Lord's baptism, I mean baptism with the Lord's Supper. Um, Paul writes and gives Titus a few helpful hints very briefly. Let's just notice two things. Number one, he says, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, to show true humility toward all men. It's literally to show all humility towards all men. Humility is the opposite of this. Humility is this. It's down. It's, it stoops to serve. Pride is this. Pride is up. I'm over you. Humility is this. I'm beneath. I come to serve. And what he's talking about is to show true humility to all men. How do you do that practically? You know what he says? One helpful bit of advice. He says, don't blaspheme anyone. Blaspheme in our culture, we're talking lost in translation. When we think blasphemy, we think of somebody who's, who says something that is against a doctrine that we hold dear. And that is one definition of blasphemy. This word blasphemy, however, it means to say something malicious against a person. It's more accurately translated slander. And that's what he tells them, not to slander everyone. And it's not just about, you know, when we think of slander, we think of don't say anything false about someone. You know what the word means? Even if something's true about someone, you don't share it if it's unkind, if it's unnecessary. It's not just, is it true? Is it kind? And is it necessary? And what Paul encourages us to do, if it's not, don't say it. Why would we do that? Because gossip splits us. We're in a time where the church, the 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 splitting that's happening in the government is entering. And I'm not going to jump, uh, really, I'm not going to jump and point a finger at anyone. Just to appraise us that Paul does value unity. We're God's children. And one way we can honor him, if it's hurtful and demeaning, don't say it. Don't say it. Um, if we speak ill of one another, we aren't guarding the cross, we're gutting it. And we're emptying the cross of power. Three gates through which you determine if a word needs to come out of your mouth or not. Especially if it's talking about someone. You hear something said about someone, and you're thinking, should I pass this on? Three gates. Number one, is it true? Ask that question first. Is it true? Second question, is it necessary? Do I really need to say this about this person? Do I really need to say this? Then the third thing, is it kind? Is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? And if it isn't, keep it to yourself. That's what Paul would have us do. Um, the issue in Crete, where Paul is writing the letter to Titus, is not just about blasphemy. There are doctrinal things that happen. Look what he says. Uh, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn him a second time after that, have nothing to do with him. You know what he says? Don't major on the minors. Don't make sure on the minors. And that's what he's saying. If you get in an argument and it's over a minor thing, don't do it. Because you can win the battle but lose the war. 
If you make the point but alienate somebody else in the body of Christ, you won the battle, you lost the war. It's the virtual equivalent of straining gnats and swallowing camels. Okay, I stood for the truth. I did. And I put him in his place. You strained a gnat and swallowed a camel. And that's, we do that. And what Paul would have us to do, um, don't get lost. Don't argue about minor things. Um, a heretic is not a person who says, a divisive person is a heretic. That's literally the word. One, a divisive person. The Greek word is heretic. One a heretic once. A heretic is not somebody who says untrue things. In that time, a heretic is a person who takes a Christian truth that's a minor truth, magnifies it out of all proportion in order to split people. That's what a heretic did in Paul's day. Magnified a minor Christian truth out of all proportion in order to split. Paul says, warn somebody like that. And then warn him a second time. Maybe you heard about, I've shared it before, about the man walking along San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. He saw a woman about to jump off. He ran to her trying to dissuade her from committing suicide. He told her simply that God loved her. And then a tear came to her eye. He then asked her, are you a Christian, a Jew, a Hindu, or what? I'm a Christian, she replied. He said, me too. Small world. Protestant or Catholic? Protestant. <laughs> Me too. What denomination? <laughs> Baptist. Me too. <laughs> Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? Northern Baptist. He remarked, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? Uh, she answered, Northern Conservative Baptist. He said, well, that's amazing. Northern conservative fundamentalist Baptist or Northern conservative reformed Baptist? Northern conservative fundamentalist Baptist. Remarkable. Northern conservative fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region or Northern conservative fundamentalist Baptist Eastern region? She told him, Northern conservative fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region. A miracle, he cried. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region of 1912. She said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region of 1912, and he shouted, die heretic, and he pushed her off the bridge. Baptism is something that we say when we want to join the family of God. Those who are going to be baptized today, come on up. Occupy the front here. Come on up and sit up front. You just get a uh, pitch with some colored fluid in it. Kool-Aid. No. No. Not going to have you drink the Kool-Aid. Not going to. Ain't going to do it. Wouldn't be prudent. Um, what, um, so when you take a cloth and dip it into, that, that's literally, that's the word for baptize. Baptize means immerse. Now, what's going to happen when I dip this white cloth into this purple-red substance? The cloth is going to come out with the same characteristics of what you baptize it into, right? So here it is. It's white. It goes in. You could keep it there a while. And now it's stained the color of the fluid. What baptism is about, what's true of what you baptize into is true of the person you baptize yourself. So let me explain. Jesus, let's say this represents Christ. There's a verse, it says, 
Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So here's the deal. Is there anything that Jesus failed to do for the Father? Anything? Any obedience that he withheld? Any price that he wasn't willing to pay? When we put our faith in Christ, what's true of Jesus becomes true of us. We then don't have to be afraid of being separated because what happens through faith in Christ is that what's true of Jesus becomes true of you. That's what baptism symbolizes. That's why it's such a great symbol. When you put your faith in Christ, you are immersed, and what's true of Jesus becomes true of you. Is there anything Jesus could do to become closer to the Father? Anything Jesus could do? If you put your faith in Christ, this is tricky, is there anything you can do to be closer to the Father? No, because baptism means what's true of Jesus becomes true of you. Could Jesus be more loved by the Father? If you put your faith in Christ, can you be more loved by the Father? No, it's because what's true of Jesus becomes true of you. That's what you will symbolize. You'll go into the water today, and it symbolizes you being joined in his death and joined in his resurrection. So what you'll be symbolizing is what's true of Jesus is true of you because you put your faith in him. Because the reason why all these people are being baptized, it's not, again, Mark pointed out, to join Hope Church. It's because Jesus told you that this is the way that you express publicly the faith you've placed in Christ. That's why all of these people, and they're going to come up and give a short statement about why, why they want to be baptized. Um, thanks. There is a very private element to ordinances. It's something that we do, and these ones, but it's public as well, as Mark said in the very beginning. So I'm going to invite you. What we're going to do, we're going to close in prayer. Uh, some of them will get ready, and uh, we're going to just walk our way out to the corner of the pond, um, and we're going to then baptize them one at a time, and then we'll come back in and enjoy refreshments. So if you can stick around, come with us to the corner, because again, this is public and private. This is about individuals taking a statement that they're joining the family of God. Let's celebrate that with them. Let me pray for us. Father, this really is not about uh, this church or any church. This is about the command that you gave and these individuals at this place determining that they want to make it. And they do this because you tell them to, and that's why. And they want to express both to us and say out loud that they are your followers. And you gave them this means whereby to proclaim that, and they're going to do that. Thank you for ordinances, ways that we can declare our faith in you, whether it be baptism or Lord's Supper. Thank you for the new covenant that you inaugurate and how it means that we can be members of your forever family. In Jesus' name, amen.